Good evening again. Sorry about the delay. There are two items on the agenda this evening. Please note that this hearing is being recorded to comply with the public law for transparency. It will be available for viewing on Borough President Adams' website, brooklyn-usa.org, or on the One Brooklyn channel on YouTube. Again, web viewers may submit timely comments to Ask Eric at brooklynbp.nyc.gov for Borough President Adams' consideration. Please call the first item and let us begin. Calendar item number one. 200188HAK. This application submitted by the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development, pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law of New York State, to designate a property at 641 Chauncey Street as an urban development action area and an urban development action area project, and pursuant to Section 197 C of the New York City Charter for the disposition of this site to a developer selected by HPD. Such actions would facilitate the, the development of a four-story building with approximately eight affordable home ownership units in Brooklyn Commu Community District 4. This application is part of a larger new infill home ownership opportunity program project intended to yield 23 affordable housing units across five development sites in the Bushwick neighborhood. Community Board 4 voted to approve this application with conditions on January 15th, 2020. Would Felipe Cortez, the representative for this application, please state your name for the record and present the application. Excuse me, um, do we have the remote? So good evening, everyone. My name is Felipe Cortez. I am from the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. With me tonight is my coworker, Lin Sen, director of HPD's Brooklyn Planning, and uh, Randall Touré from Riceboro, the development team working on the project that we will discuss tonight. As part of the EULA process, we are very excited to be here tonight presenting 641 Chancey Street, uh, this time to the Bureau of President. 641 Chancey Street, will be a new four-story building with approximately eight affordable co-op units, 641. Um, to start the presentation, um, I will describe the proposed land use actions this Europe application is, uh, is seeking, and I will provide a description of the project site, its location, and the site's surrounding area. Randall will then provide some details of the proposed project on uh, 641 Chancey Street, including affordability levels um, and, will, and building designs. We will, then, we will then discuss the anticipated timeline for the project. So after discussing the timeline, we will have time for questions. So please keep track of your questions as we go so we can answer them later. So. <clears throat> This ULOP application is before the Bureau President seeking urban development action area designation and project approval and the disposition of the vacant city owned property located at 641 Chancey Street on block 3444, lot 18. The proposed actions will facilitate the construction of a new four story building with approximately eight affordable co op units. The development site is located on the west side of Chancey Street, south of uh, Bushwick Avenue, north of Broadway, and east of uh, Moffat Street. The development site is within a transit zone that encompasses all of Brooklyn Community District 4. The development site is well served by public, uh, by public transit. The J, M, and Z subway stations are located within walking distance from the development site. The development site surrounding area is predominantly residential with one and two family, as well as multi-family residential buildings, ranging from uh, two to four stories. Commercial uses can be found along, uh, Broadway, along Broadway. The development site shared the block with the, the, with the Bushwick Multi-Service Center building, which houses the community board offices uh, and a food pantry. In addition, Riceboro's Moffat Garden, an assisted living facility for seniors, is located on the same block. Um, and the Eddie Harris residential facility, a men-only shelter, is also located um, west of the development site. 
in the same block. Before handing over the presentation to Randall, um, I would like to say that 641 Chancellor Street is part of the, of the larger project called Old Stanley, which involves the, um, another two city-owned lots and two private sites. Um, we're all, we, I, would like, I would like also to say that we are very excited to be working with the development team on 641 Chancellor Street and in the larger um, Old Stanley project as it will create much needed, much needed affordable home ownership units at a currently vacant and underutilized sites and in a neighborhood where affordable home ownership opportunities are rare. So now I'm going to hand it over to Randall. Thank you. Thank you, Felipe. Um, so, as you know, Risborough has been in this community for over 40 years, and we have been an affordable housing developer in this community. And this is an opportunity, once again, to not only can keep to our message, but also to um, create some opportunities, home ownership opportunities for the community. So this particular um, development is an eight-unit co-op building. Um, it's three one-bedrooms, three two-bedrooms, and two three-bedrooms. And it's four stories tall, so it's, um, it's uh, contextual with the community. Um, the, um, it's an 80 to 100% AMI, uh, in-unit washers, dryers, bicycle storage, backyard area. Um, the building uh, foot, uh, square footage envelope is about 8,220 square feet. Um, it will be developed under enterprise uh, green community standards and it will be HPD regulated resale value. So this is one of the things that um, a lot of people are concerned about is that, you know, once someone purchases an affordable unit, what will happen? How will we maintain affordability? And HPD has worked <coughs> at trying to um, make sure that that stays affordable. So if it's resold, it will still be in an affordable co-op in the community. So these are just basically uh, a site plan of the units. It's, as we said, it's um, a small uh, eight unit co-op. And so this is an opportunity to see sort of uh, the footprint of the property. So um, this is what many people are concerned about. You know, what is the qualifying income? So we're looking at 80, 95, and 100% of AMI. So when you look at the qualifying income of a family of four, we're looking at $64,000 for 80% AMI, uh, 105,000 for and 95% AMI, and then the 100% AMI is between 80 and 111,000. So these are for families, and it's for um, it is actually uh, conducive with some of the demographics in the area, related particularly to city workers, um, teachers, uh, uh, firefighters, others that live in the community. So, do you want to read this or you? Okay, so this is just a brief recap. HPD is seeking ULERP approval of 641 Chauncey Street for the development of eight affordable co op units, uh, co op uh, affordable to household earnings between 80 to 100% AMI. The unit mix is three one bedrooms, uh, three two bedrooms, two three bedrooms. The units will include dishwashers and washer dryers. Uh, building includes bike storage, recreational rear yard uh, for residents, uh, enterprise green community standards. Uh, project will be financed under HPD's Open Door Program. And six, uh, 641 Chauncey Street is part of Old Stanley that will result in, uh, t that will result in a total of five new buildings and 19 ownership units and four affordable uh, rental units. Um, some of the local hiring opportunities, we will be able to hire locally from Bushwick for the development of this. Um, further employment of MWBE contractors and vendors. Stat Architect is an MWBE firm. HPD, uh, will, um, the hiring will go through the uh, Hire NYC portal, and then Riceboro has its own workforce and development training programs uh, called Level Up. Uh, this is the uh, anticipated timeline. I'll so this is the anticipated timeline for the project. Um, as you will see, as you can see, uh, the project got, the application got certified in November 12th. 
We went to the land use and the full board uh, uh, meetings of community, four, community board number four. We got their support on January 15th. Uh, tonight, January 29th, we're here. Um, overall, we would say that the project is looking to get the, um, the public approvals done by the summer of 2020 um, and start the anticipated uh, housing connect, in other words, like the marketing around the spring 2022 and the anticipated construction completion of the project, it's around uh, the summer of 2022. And with that, we are open for questions. So we have a few questions. You touched on some of the things in the presentation, but we want you to develop some of the, 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 the questions that we have. So Community Board 4 has expressed concerns that the target area median incomes for, for this project remain out of reach for many of the local residents. What consideration has been given in order to make some of these attainable for Bushwick, Bushwick household, households to qualify? Sure. Uh, thank you very much. So um, one of the things that we um, recognize is that um, the AMIs that were listed um, were higher than normal for an affordable project. So generally, we operate in the 60% um, AMI range, um, with maybe at best 80%. But those are for rentals and affordable rentals. This is a home ownership opportunity, and this is also an opportunity for individuals in the community who often fall outside of our affordable uh, range to look and begin to look at uh, being at buying an affordable uh, home ownership option. So for a co-op or condo, sorry, co-op in this case, to purchase, you, you're basically looking at that 80 to 100% um, range, but it's still far below what um, a lot of uh, co-op opportunities are um, in this city, and particularly even in um, the Bushwick area, it falls outside of that range. So have you given consideration, given that half the units are an opportunity for Bushwick and the other half, you know, just beyond. For the units that maybe Bushwick can't afford, maybe going to a higher price point, going to 110, 120% AMI. So for each 10% up you go, you go 10% down. So maybe you take 100, go to 110, the 80 becomes 70. Or, you know, juggling the AMIs in that way so you can get some AMIs that gives some people in Bushwick a chance. You know, what's the if you have a 50% local preference and you don't end up with anybody, that's not going to feel like a good outcome. Well, um, the options the options that you are like mentioning, Richard, uh, we could look into it, but per term sheet, the open door term sheet allows to um, units to be affordable to uh, households making at minimum 80% and a maximum to 130%. Um, with that option, as you mentioned, if we look to raise like the number of units at 110, the number of maybe units at 80% of my my increase, uh, but we cannot we cannot go lower than than 80%. Does um, anything legally bar you from taking an 80 and knocking it down to 70 by having 100 go to 110? I'm not I'm not sure about like legally bounding, but um, I believe that it could be also related. We maybe we want to be financially uh, responsible. Um, we don't want to become. Um, these units are a burden for like potential home buyers, um, but again, I'm not aware of any legally bonding issues like, that stop us from do the, doing this. But we also want to be financially responsible. Well, again, if somebody's got enough income to get a mortgage, you expect them to be responsible, right? So, I would give serious consideration to ways to give some Bushwick residents an opportunity. You know, we may not get 50%, but we don't want to have zero in the end. And again, no. it's not just this site, you know, you're financing 23 units in here. I know a few are rental, but you know, you need to look to get AMIs where folks in Bushwick become part of this equation. And, and, and I would like to say that um, just recently, maybe not going that far than last year, HPD and Riceboro were here presenting another project called uh, Bushwick Alliance, which was a uh, rental project, uh, 28 units. Um, as a rental project, we were like that project was targeting uh, lower MIs. We had units at uh, 27 percent, and the higher MI was 20, uh, 77. Um, as Render was saying, the 
you know, the objective of this, pro of this project is to serve like potential home buyers. Um, these are sites very difficult to develop, very cost. It costs very high um, to develop this site. The open door term sheet allows like uh, a city subsidy that allows us to develop these sites. Um, so but we're not changing like, the economics. If we have somebody right. else go up to 110, 80 goes down to 70, same economics for the developer. I, I can get back to you on why we can go like lower than 70, but I will maybe say, right, say it again. Or maybe you can bring the, back that you can do it. I don't know. But we want to be financially responsible. Now, addressing the topic, or another part of the question about the, the any additional assistance programs. Um, HPD has a program called Home First. It's an assistance program that uh, seeks to um, support first-time home buyers, qualifying first-time home buyers with uh, down payment cost or closing cost. Uh, to qualify to this uh, program, you need to make up to 80% of MI. So, Understanding that this project has units at 80% of MI, we believe that some Bushwick residents can benefit from this program. Um, so that's a, a program that we have available for like Bushwick <coughs> residents. Yeah, thank you, Felipe. I think I think he like said a lot that um, that I had in mind too. But I, I think just we have to keep in mind these are really tight budgets as is. The budget's the same. No, no, I mean, so. Right, so I didn't change your budget. So it can't be about the budget. I'm sorry. I I'm didn't guessing. change your budget. If you collected income at 110 and you bring somebody You're down asking us to raise. It's the exact same math. Well, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm not the underwriter here. Okay. Um, I, and and our, term sheets, exactly our term sheets are you know, from 80 to 130. So, and, and I think what Felipe is talking about is while maybe someone making 70% AMI does have a down payment, but owning a home comes with expenses. Correct. Right, so, so the cost of transportation doesn't change for you. The cost for healthcare doesn't change for you. The cost of schooling and like additional things doesn't change for you. So if something happens to your home, if you're a lower income, it, it becomes a greater burden. And so, so that is the piece I think you know, we're looking at and why, why it was set at 80% AMI. And, and we are not the people who worked on the term sheet. But I, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why um, we settled on that. And, and I think you know, when you look at these prices, they are certainly way below the market for home ownership in Bushwick. And, and this project, and like all of our open door projects, have been very difficult to even make the numbers work with the current term sheet. And it's, but it is a small slice of our HPD finance programs that we hope can build equity um, in the Bushwick community and in other communities that we're trying to bring these home ownership opportunities to. So I think we hear the concern and we certainly look into it. Um, um, but, but I think also like a, with an understanding that um, we are, this is, really what, what we're bringing to the table is would likely hit somebody, 10 people in Bushwick, 10 households in Bushwick. We're not gonna count them as much if they've lived there the last year or two to qualify for the 50% local preference. You know, you want people that had a longer history to have success here? Yeah, sure. So I think one of the things that you're, and, and, I, and I'm glad that this conversation is happening now because a lot of times it, takes place later and everybody's a little upset at this point. So what you're talking about now is that we basically, we have a program for home ownership where the, you know, potentially a family of four that makes $64,000 can own their own home in, in Bushwick. And then the question is, well, who's gonna be able to afford this? Where are these people at? Well, it's, I think it's gonna be incumbent upon us as part of our marketing, working with the community, working with the community board, going out there now and start identifying individuals, letting them go through a uh, financial literacy program, letting them go a uh, uh, financial literacy program, letting them go through different um, aspects, letting them say that you can potentially own a home in this location, in our other locations, and here's what you have to do. And we start identifying. I can tell you right now. I know everybody's saying there is. They're not there. They're there because we get um, applications all the time for people who want affordable housing that are at 80% AMI, that they're above, they're at that $64,000 uh, level. 
and they can't get affordable housing because they're above that 60%. They're at 80, they're at 85, they're at 90. So they're in the community and they're working, they take their kids to school, they do all of these things. And at, at this point, they would rather own a home, they would rather own a co-op than get affordable housing, but they want that affordable housing we build. But if we can say to them, what about if we help you get this uh, co-op and you live in the community? And these are not people who've just been here a day or two. These are folks who've been living in the community a very long time. So I think that we can work together with the community board, with others, to help begin to market this program now so that we can start identifying the exact same individuals you, you're talking about. And maybe that 50% um, guarantee it goes to 80, 85%. And I, I think that's where we can um, make a difference. So I know we have a representative community board, not sure if it's speaking any matter, but obviously you have several months before this goes to the city council. Mm -hmm. It might be nice to share some stats of eligible households yeah. before this process plays out. Yeah, I think that, that, that we can definitely do that. I think we can work with the, with the community board. We can work with other community leaders and show that, like, just like I said, from our experience with folks applying for affordable housing, that they just fall outside of our limits, that they are already in the community, and they would love to, in many cases, own homes. I'm sorry, any other questions? Oh, yeah, sure, actually. Since you're on that slide, mm -hmm. can you break down uh, sort of the unit by because it doesn't seem like it's broken down uh, sure. a little bit more precisely if you could break it down. So for Chancey Street, we are talking about we have one unit uh, at 80 percent, which is going to be a one bedroom. We have uh, one bedroom, um, one unit, which is going to be a three bedroom apartment at 95 percent. And then we have, let me go over here. And we have three two bedrooms at 100 and one three bedroom at 100 percent of MI for a total of eight co-ops. So it's not going to be exactly that dollar amount. There's got to be a range, right? Can you give us the minimum range and the maximum dollar amount range for that income size? Right. For the 80 percent and 90 percent, right now, because of the nature of the project, the nature of the um, home ownership projects, we don't have exact, the budget is not finalized. So we know that right now that the sale price is going to be 190. The, quali the, the qualifying income right now is 64 for. Like well, it can't 80%. be exactly. It's got to have some range. No, I know, but ballpark. because of the nature of the of the project, the budget, we don't even have clarity on like the income then. That's if you're like referencing to that. Do you that gives you the, the, as the, few the, as a thousand dollars. Might it be several thousand dollars? We don't know that yet. We don't know that yet. There okay. might be some. There might be a range. But we well, don't, it can't we be don't an exact dollar. You have to have something, right? I mean, these are approximate numbers. So this could be 63 something, 64 something. As a reference, we put it at 64. And do you expect to have that when you get to the council? Hopefully, yeah. So, and then and then the range here in the hundred percent is is dictated by the um, different unit type that we're describing. I know you mentioned the financial literacy campaign. Sort of, can you talk about what marketing strategies that you'd be using sure. for the uh, literacy campaign? Sure. Um, we are work. I, mean, I, I hate to punt and say we're working on it, but we are working. Uh, we have a partner called Neighborhood Restore that has a very long-standing um, financial literacy program, and we've already reached out to them to help us on this potential uh, portion of the home ownership. Um, I think financial literacy is a, is a critical piece, and, and it's a long lead time item, so we would like to um, start that as soon as we get you know, further along in the approval process, um, start that, uh, that portion of the home ownership piece. And I think I said, like I said, we can then begin to market directly to the community board for and, and, and make sure that folks from that community are involved in that project. So our next question, actually, um, what consideration has been given to requiring that these sites be disposed with permanent affordable housing restrictions according to the shared equity model? What happens year 40, basically? Well, um, 
because these are going to be co-ops, exactly. They can, be, uh, they can benefit from an Article 11, which allows for 40 years of uh, um, um, affordability period. After the, when the 40 years are about to expire, the HDFC can go back to the city and ask for another 40 years. And they can continue repeating that process when the 40 years are up. And who is the HDFC in this case? Uh, it's going to be um, the exact name is, I don't remember exactly, but it's Southern Bushwick Neighborhood Housing Fund Company. And it's mainly um, an entity created for Riceboro. So it's a subset of Riceboro. So yeah. given Riceboro's mission, would Riceboro want to go on record at some point in terms of its policies, in terms of when year 40 comes up, in terms uh, of extending? Yes. Yes, you go, mean? Go on record as saying that we would be always encouraging long-term affordability, and if we can work, find a way to work with the city to um, get make that happen, we're, we're there. So as long as the city doesn't present obstacles nearly 40 years out. Thank you. So we have one, one last question, mm -hmm. actually. So the borough president um, is very concerned about promoting renewable and sustainable energy. So what types of programs, or have you considered DEP rain gardens, um, passive, house, passive house designs? So um, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, as you know, Riseboro is one of the leaders in developing passive house designs. And um, this project um, is not going to be uh, a, thank you. This project is not going to be a, a <coughs> passive house project, but what it will be is a uh, sustainable project will have the same um, aspects of passive house such as the uh, high quality insulation and energy efficiency HVACs and um, appliances. Um, one of the things that we will be uh, trying to incorporate are the green uh, elements on the roof of the backyard of the buildings but one of the things we also have to always understand is that we're trying to hit affordability so if we can find a way to incorporate like say a rain garden into this project without it continues increasing um, um, costs, then we will do that. But we will be doing all of our normal um, energy efficiencies and sustainability uh, models that we, we do across the board. It won't go for passive house certification just because there are costs that's involved in doing this but we will be going for high levels of uh, sustainability and energy efficiency. And given that the rain gardens we're talking about within the public realm mm -hmm. and you know, DEP initiatives, you know, we'd like you to talk to DEP and see you know, if it's something that they're providing funding, you know, if it's helping to solve, right? right yeah. you know, then it should be within budget if they're looking to work with you. Yeah, with DEP, I mean, if we can have some sort of um, ability where it sort of can be added to the, um, to the project without increasing costs, which will then affect the numbers here, then we would definitely look at that. It's something you may that want to just start do. engaging DEP yep. to see if this is an, a priority area for them that they would look to want to fund. Absolutely, and we will work with our architects uh, stat to do that. Thank you very much. Okay, that concludes our questions. Thank you very Thank you. much. Uh, our chair of Community Board 4, Robert Camacho. You come the uh, shorter way. As you know, we sent you the recommendations and what we wanted uh, in regards to, I just want to bring a, a, a little notion and uh, so if my daughter's 25 and uh, she's a police officer, she makes the bare minimum, you know, when you start in your own probation. So she lived in Bush for 25 years, I lived there 59, so she can't afford a, a condo there. So now, and if she does, and it's 40 years, 30 years, the mortgage is paid off, right? In 30 years? So now they're not giving us to stay permanent affordable. 
because he said that they'll fight for 40, 40 more years, and if they say no, then what? Then we're right back to the way Bushwick is now. So that's why we have to force them to make sure that it stays affordable. That's the catch. Because in 30 years, the mortgage is paid off. Do the math. And in 40 years, that their cap, my daughter will be 65. So she'll be on a broke income. Then we'll start all over with what's happening now, where seniors like us can't afford to live in the community because the people are making. See, it's, it's a, people think I, I'm, I'm no fool. And two and two is four. Or you could say 22, but they think it's, you're, you're a fool. And another thing that we indicated that we wanted to was the, that was very important, was the providing a, one, a response to the question about Riseboro application taking a development fee, and if that could be disclosed. They answered only a preliminary answer that was provided at the meeting providing resource to build the gap between HPD and, first, and Home First program and IMI level eligibility. And the next thing was uh, a commitment with you. They said that they would for people that, so there's a lawsuit now for people that live in the community to get. And the last one was the commitment to permanent affordability. So they said they will, will apply for four, we don't want them to apply. We want them here for 40 years. Because you see the numbers at 30, she paid the condo off. She's 65. Then what? Then she can't afford to live there. Then we'll start all over with the taxes, the uh, uh, HOA dues that they have, or the dues that they have. And if her income doesn't pay, then go what? Now she's out of her home. And that's what's going on now. We have seniors that do own home for many years. Their taxes go up. They get the program star. They get a little program on the town. Just because next door they did a 64 unit, now the property value goes up. Now she has to maintain it. Now they don't have the money and they have no fixed income. One dies, and then the old person is, and then they knock their house down and make another one. So we want to make sure. I know riceboro has been there 40 years. I've been there 59. I've been there before Riceboro even started. So. I know the area very well, and we need to, to make sure we keep our seniors, our kids that are in shelters, that are commuting, that the, 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 all the schools are under-enrolled. So we need to make sure we fight for the people that been there when times are hard, and now that times are good, we want to make sure that we stay there. And it's getting harder and harder and harder and harder. And only because, like he said, money, money has nothing to do with the people that made the place there and made what it is. Only because you can't afford X amount. And that's sad. And it's sad that we've been in that area all our lives fighting for the bare minimum. And still in 2020, we're still fighting. So it shouldn't be. Rice Bell knows better. They all know better. They've been around a long time. They know the seniors passes away and then they go and they rent the apartments. The apartments are not affordable. So we gotta make sure that if I get old, I can afford to live in one of those places. Cause I broke my lumbar spine and my income now is only $35,000. And my mortgage is 25 and my wife's still working and we're still trying to keep our house because we wanna live there. So those are the things that we're suffering. So those are the things you need to look and take care of. Because I want her to get a house in, in Bushwick. I want her to raise in Bushwick. Those are the future now. I want to pass the torch and make sure that they take care of our community. And if we don't all stick together, we ain't all going to be here. Thank you. Asiri? Asiri. Asiri, OK. Um, so I had a question. You could just state your full name for the record. Oh, yes. Uh, full name, Asaya Polite. Um, so I was just taking out some numbers about how many units were for each AMI. Um, and I know for the one bedroom, you said that one of the units was for 80% or did you say all of the units were for 80%? Okay, great. So you said one unit is gonna be at 80%, which is your lowest AMI number here. 
um, and that's also for a family of four. So let's say it's a full family, husband, wife, two kids. Um, so based on that, um, I'm assuming that you're expecting for all four of these individuals to be living in the same bedroom. No. We'll have to go for the two bedroom. So, this, so what exactly if it's a family, I guess, of two for the 80, what does that look like? If you want to submit in writing, and then we can put it on a recommendation report and be able to share that way. Okay, perfect. Um, just because I was just thinking about this in terms of a uh, family of fours, I currently am a family of one, um, and I actually live at home because I can't afford many residents that's in Bushwick, and just wanted to see what would that look like for someone that's in my circumstances, as many people in Bushwick also have those same concerns where they still are living at home because of situations like this. So I could ask that if HPD prepare that. I assume uh, one bedroom is considered a family of two. As, so if you could get us the number for that, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it's being picked up in the mic. If you do want to share the information for the larger public. Thanks for the question. Lin Zhang from HPD again. So for the 80% AMI, it's a one bedroom. And so for that is for a single person or, or a family of two. Um, and those AMIs at 80 is a single person, uh, 58,480 uh, for a single person, and for a couple, uh, we're looking at 66,800. So those are the qualifying incomes. Thank you for so much. Uh, I just also want to add, uh, if Ridgewood Bush, Riseboro, sorry, uh, believes that 80% AMI is a good bottom number, taking say one of the hundreds and bringing it down to 80 and maybe taking two hundreds and going to 110 you know you're again you're serving more people so I'm not saying you maybe need to go to 70 but bringing more units to the low even if you have to take some of the hundreds and go higher right you know get a project you feel comfortable with but get a project that has more opportunity for the community Um, not it goes on the, the mic. mic it will go to the mic. Yeah, yeah. We'll be a little less formal. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I just want to address um, just one thing, and that is um, I don't, one of the things that um, I want to be clear about is that um, our um, being in this project is not uh, about money, but about taking advantage of a program that HPD had that will allow us to create affordable housing for individuals who want to own. Okay, we have worked, done a lot of affordable housing for rentals, and this is an opportunity to do just at the bare minimum some affordable housing. Now, is it perfect? No, um, but we are gonna continue to work with the community. We'll continue to work with the community board. And I, and I, and I unfortunately, I wasn't at that community board meeting on, on where you know, these questions were uh, broached. If I was, I would have you know, um, uh, uh, some better answers. But what I would like to do is to continue the dialogue and make sure that we get to a point where we, because we said, if, we, if you had said there are some conditions, we're gonna try our best to meet those conditions. Okay, so I don't think we're here to say, you know, um, you know, oh, this is the only way it can be done. I think we still have some flexibility that we can work with the community board in addressing those issues. And as, a, as far as, you know, um, young people that are still in the community looking for affordable housing, we're doing our best to create affordable housing. Rentals, as you know, we've created quite a few rentals in, um, in Bushwick area, and, and they're still out there, there's still opportunities. So if you know folks who want to, you know, unfortunately a lot of that rentals because it's uh, low income, you have to go through Housing Connect, but I believe Housing Connect um, is changing their format, and so you'll be able to sort of be more targeted in, in, in how you want to be able to reach people. We create affordable housing and we have a long-term um, um, mission to continue affordable housing, you know, for another 40 years. Like you said, well, 40 years, what happens after 40 years? Well, if, if, if uh, Riseboro is still around in another 40 years, we'll continue further. We'll keep creating affordable housing because we're not, we're not going anywhere. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else that would like to speak that has not submitted a speaker slip?
Hearing none, Richard, if you could please close this calendar yeah, item. Yeah, calendar item number one is closed. Thank you, uh, presenters. Um, calendar item number two, 190377ZMK, 190378ZRK. These applications submitted by SUW4 LLC pursuant to sections 197-C and 201 of the New York City Charter for a zoning map amendment to change the northwest corner of Bay Parkway and 60th Street from an R5 district to R6 and establish a C2-4 overlay within the rezoning area as well as a zoning text amendment to designate the property as a mandatory inclusionary housing area. Such actions would facilitate the development of a nine-story mixed-use building with a 6,200 square foot commercial floor, ground floor, 6,600 square feet of community facility uses above, and 36 dwelling units of which approximately 11 would be affordable to households earning 70 to 135 percent AMI, according to the MIH workforce option. The building would provide 24 accessory parking spaces in the cellar. Community Board 12 voted to approve this application on January 28, 2020. Would Rachel Scow, Scow, sorry, the representative for this application, please state your name for the record and present the application. Hi. My name is Rachel Skull. I'm an associate at Greenberg Charig. We represent SUW4 LLC, the applicant seeking this uh, to rezone 5914 through 5920 Bay Parkway from its current R5 zoning district to an R6 zoning district with a C24 overlay, also be mapped for mandatory inclusionary housing. Joined today by Joel Spitzer on behalf of SUW4. So the proposed rezoning area is at the northwest corner of Bay Parkway and 60th Street, both wide streets. It's part of a R5 district um, that's located approximately two blocks south of Washington Cemetery and two blocks uh, west of McDonald Avenue. Um, in this area of Brooklyn, a corner lot in an R5 zoning district can be improved with 1.65 FAR of residential use and 2.0 uh, FAR of com community facility use, and there can be a maximum height of 40 feet. Um, our client owns the approximately 100 by 100 foot development site that makes up the proposed rezoning area on block 5515, shown here. Um, the site is currently unimproved. Uh, the development site sits at the intersection of Bay and 60th. It's across uh, Bay Parkway from a Rite Aid. Oh, sorry, here's the reasoning area. Um, it's across Bay Parkway from a Rite Aid with accessory parking, which you can see in image four there on the right. The development site is the area with the green construction fence. Um, across 60th Street is a nine-story medical facility, the Calco Medical Facility. Um, so you see the, the Calco Medical Facility in the three images there, the Rite Aid in image eight. Um, and the site is catty corner from um, Bishop Kearney High School, which is an approximately 90,000 square foot high school um, shown in image six there on the left. Um, the area back behind the Rite Aid is a C C82 zoning district. It's um, mostly low rise auto uh, body shops, warehouse facilities, and then the, air ha the area to the south is a mix of R6 and R6A districts with commercial overlays along Bay Parkway. And here's the area again, seen from a couple of different angles. Um, so the rezoning would allow for um, up to 4.8 FAR of development, all of which could be used for community facility use. Um, up to 3.6 of which could be used for residential use with provision of affordable housing pursuant to MIH, and the ground floor could contain commercial uses. Uh, this would allow for up to 48,000 square feet of development on this uh, approximately 10,000 square foot site. Our client's design for the building has evolved to an approximately 46,000 square foot building, be approximately 6,000 square feet of local retail use on the ground floor approximately 6,000 square feet of community facilities on the second floor, and the balance would be uh, residential uses, approximately 10,000 square feet of which, or 30%, uh, would be affordable pursuant to the proposed MIH workforce option. Um, so as you can see here, the proposed building would rise to a height of nine stories, which would be 95 feet. 
um, in an R6 district in, in a mandatory inclusionary housing area where you have the inclusionary housing on site, you can go to a maximum 115 feet. Here, um, we're not doing that because we really wanna maximize the floor plates, otherwise you start to lose out on rentable square feet by making the floor plates smaller, having cores cut through more floors. So that's why we're sticking with the nine stories. Um, I also wanna point out a number of setbacks that are required here. So where you have an R6 district adjacent to R5 districts, which we have on both sides of this property, um, on 60th and on Bay Parkway, it's a number of zoning controls to make sure that the new buildings, such as this one, won't overwhelm the surrounding buildings. So first, from each side lot line, we need to set back, set back eight feet um, from the beginning, nothing built within those eight feet. Then within 25 feet of each lot line, the new building will not be permitted to exceed 45 feet. Um, and then of course you have your street setbacks 10 feet from each street frontage required above the maximum 65 foot height, uh, 65 foot base height. Um, as a practical matter, this building is also masked so that on 60th Street adjacent to the neighbor there shown at the top of the page, within 30 feet of that, um, that zoning lot line there, there will be only a one story portion of the building so that we can provide legal light and air to the residences. So this is the building in elevation uh, shown from 60th Street. Um, we are proposing the workforce option which is laid out there. Something that I know has caused confusion and I'm sorry that it has and that I wanna clarify. Um, when we drafted this application, when it was certified, the building, the interiors were laid out for 41 units. Since that time, the developer has spent more time on this. They wanted to make the units bigger, which is how we got to the 36 units that we're showing currently, which pursuant to the 30% workforce option would yield 11 affordable units. Parking spaces on this site, and my client is working with um, um, uh, consultants to come up with an automated parking facility that could provide those spaces. Um, the massing that we had previously re relied on an attendant and we think that we need a way to, to provide this parking without that attendant. Um, so to run through a few renderings, images of the building, this is the building viewed from um, Bay Parkway. You can see that four-story portion on the right. Uh, it's one of the required setbacks from the smaller buildings to the north. Um, and you see the Calco Medical Facility to the south. Um, and here is the view from 60th Street. Again, this is the one-story portion of the building that I was talking about within 30 feet of that shared lot line in order to provide le legal light and air to the units. But that one-story portion, the first 25 feet of it, cannot go above um, 45 feet. Um, just a few more images. This is looking from down 60th Street, uh, looking east. And here is what the um, pedestrian experience would, would potentially look like. Um, we believe that the proposed rezoning will help create a transition between the lower rise residences to the east and north and this dense intersection of Bay Parkway and 60th Street while bringing a local retail community facility and affordable housing to the development site. Happy to answer any questions. The first question actually deals with the number of affordable units. If you can just sort of break down by income, rents, distribution of units by bedroom size. So the units proposed in the building are one to three bedrooms. Um, to walk through the workforce option, so the average AMI cannot exceed 115%. For a family of four, that's approximately $123,000. Um, the maximum income bracket cannot exceed 135%. And for a family of four, that's approximately $144,000. Um, 5% of the residential floor area must be reserved for 70% AMI, which for a family of four is approximately $75,000. And another 5% must be reserved for 90% AMI, which is approximately $96,000 for a family of four. Um, we have not gotten as far as to know the rents yet. That's something that we're going to have to work out with HPD as we work out exactly what the unit mix for the affordable and what the AMIs will be. Actually, the next question, um, it's a two-part question that deals with the marketing strategies. Given the community's concerns regarding displacement and the prevalence of rent burden households, please identify 
What marketing strategies, such as designating one of the community's affordable housing nonprofits as the affordable housing administering agent, would be used in the tenant selection process in order to ensure the highest level of participation from Community District 12, especially those that are rent burdened or at risk of displacement? Charles Spitzer. Okay, we have started to to work with uh, like legitimate companies, respectable companies like Reside New York and others to make sure that it goes goes with the regular, the legal um, how it works regular, and uh, that's the way we're going to work. We're with professional companies, we're not going to do it ourselves. We're going to do it with a regular professional company that are out, out there to make sure that everyone gets a chance, the same chance, and will be uh, legit. So have you so you haven't selected a company? No, already not yet. yet. But we are in process of selecting a company. We did some research or something. Again, working with companies, community-based organizations, housing, nonprofits. Yeah, the ho housing companies. They want to specialize with, with the lotteries, with the whole, with the, how it works, the, the, the applications, everything. We're, we're not going to do it like ourselves. We'll do it with uh, professional companies. That's the main thing. What, which companies we didn't, uh, we didn't uh, agree upon, but uh, we are working with professional companies. They are going to lead us, and it's going to go through them. We're not going to be involved. I mean, they're going to be involved in the whole process. And if they're not locally based, I would just also recommend to network within the local organizations to help connect people to the events. Yeah, definitely. There are a lot of faith-based organizations throughout the community and local. whatnot that you might want to have whoever you designate be in touch with to help definitely. advertise. Definitely, yeah. And so I guess to follow up on that, would you have a, like a financial literacy campaign to help uh, those residents, you know, become lottery eligible? Please explain what? Like a, a literacy campaign to help, to help the residents become eligible. That's part of the marketing yes. strategy. That's mm -hmm. something that they are going to eventually work with the company that they choose. So unfortunately, we don't have those details yet. Um, just to follow up on the point that you were just making, uh, we will reach out for a list of some of those organizations that you were mentioning. Uh, we are planning to work with Community Board 12, but if we have the names of some or other organizations, that would be great. And so we'll reach out to your office for that. And you may also want to, with the council member's office. Yes. Yes. They'll give you good guidance. Great. In connection with the commercial and community facility floor area, has there been any consideration um, to provide affordable space for like local arts organizations, cultural institutions? Do you want to go to the okay. um, we have the community facility, what we have here that's probably going to be, we're looking out for doctor's offices, but as of uh, arts and the non-profit, um, we haven't done anything yet, but. We would uh, be open to recommendations on the, any non for profit. Okay, so Will, I think talking to the community board and to the council member would help understand groups out in the neighborhood that might benefit from space that, you know, where they are now might be spatially challenged in terms of future rent increases. So I think the community board and the council member are best places to seek out organizations in the yeah, Thank you. And, and the next question uh, deals with, you know, um, the borough president wants to promote, make sure we're promoting uh, renewable and sustainable energy. Has there been any um, consideration to um, use passive house design or DEP rain gardens? for the project? Passive well, house designs uh, we didn't discuss yet, but uh, definitely the rain gardens, uh, I think because it's by white, by white Street, I think it will be very possible to do that, the, the rain gardens. And, and on the roof, again, I know the city law has changed, so you're required to do green and or solar, mm -hmm. but uh, other things given the height, there may be reasons why s those smaller wind turbines might work. And also, you could incorporate even blue roofs. Like sometimes, green and blue could be done in the same system. So, just something to think about. Yeah, definitely. We, I mean, the roof is a, a big thing today, and the, 
all the developments. So we definitely see how the, what the architecture, how it works. We we'll definitely incorporate some of these uh, um, um, energy uh, efficient things. And the, and the last uh, question deals with the borough president's policy in terms of maximizing good quality jobs. Has there been any consideration to ensure the inclusion and participation of minority and wi women in business-owned business uh, enterprises in the process of construction on the site? Mm -hmm. There was some discussion about it, but de definitely that uh, when we give out the, all the bids for the, for the project, um, they will have first priority to, to bid on the project. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much. So there's no one here for questions. So Richard, if you can close this calendar item. Calendar item number two is closed. Okay. The hearing on these items is now closed. Thank you for participating in the public hearing. Borough President Adams will review the applications we heard today and will soon submit his recommendations to the City Planning Commission. Borough President Adams would like to take this opportunity to remind you that the City Planning Commission will hold a public hearing on these items. The hearing is now adjourned. Borough President Adams would like to remind those viewing on the website that timely comments can be submitted by email to askeric at brooklynbp.nyc.gov. Thank you. Good night.